Well, hello there, Wonder Dippers. Uh, long time, no YouTube transmission. I know, but this video is a step toward remedying that. More specifically, this clip with the wise, kind, academic psychologist and best-selling author, Dr. Lisa Miller. She is just so inspirational, and I would say she is exceptional among the exceptional humans that I've had the opportunity to meld minds with on this podcast. Uh, the kind of work she does is so difficult to find because it really is a sober, real sweet spot between spirituality and science. Her book, The Awakened Brain in particular, is just so good. Uh, high, high recommend from this Wonder Dipper. She's really one of the few people that understands both our need for myth and initiation and spiritual purpose, along with the analytical, the psychological, and the neurological side of the equation. Uh, and in this clip in particular, we get into the mental health epidemic, the suicide epidemic, and how purpose, story, and meaningful struggle is really central to not only digging yourself out of a hole when you're in one, but to, to sound cliche, kind of find your life's purpose in general. I'm also going to be posting this full video pod soon, so if you enjoy this, definitely check that out. And with that, let's get into it. But first, uh, do caress that like and subscribe button, as it does help increase the circumference of our psychic splash. And also, if you aren't aware, the Third Eye Drops podcast has over 300 audio-only podcasts available on Apple Pods, Spotify, or wherever you listen. So do look us up on your pod platform of choice and tickle those algorithms for us as well. I, yeah, I mean, it's, it certainly has. I, I feel like we're constantly in this tension between, you know, on, on one hand, careening toward this more awakened, more connected way of being and absolute disaster. And it feels like one of them has to win out. And, and, I, and I hold out optimism. I really am a more optimistic person than a pessimistic person. But as you point out, you know, there is a depression epidemic. There is a suicide uh, epidemic. And if I remember the numbers correctly, I believe that the suicide numbers skew actually toward more affluent groups, like, like people like in, in, you know, white, higher income male groups are like most likely to kill themselves. And, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to bring up, um, more on the, the MRI scans of the brain, but I think this will, will circle back into it. Um, because I also, had in my notes that I wanted to ask you about depression and the philosophy mm -hmm. of depression and, you know, the sort of prevailing, again, materialistic theory that, okay, here's what depression is. It's a, um, you know, it's an imbalance of neurotransmitters. You need to get on, get on an SSRI and, you know, fix, fix your levels of serotonin, and then we'll dial you in and you'll be good. And your depression will be cured if not treated and you'll be ready to live your life in a more productive happy healthy way right like that that's sort of at least to i think the the lay person is the 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 gist of of the clinical view of depression but in watching and reading your material i i feel like there's a bit more philosophical nuance to to your view on that topic could you could you unpack that well you've spelled it out perfectly that you know we're knee deep in a model of depression, which is a fix it model. You know, something's broken and let's fix it. You take this pill, your thinking is bad. You take this different thought, you know, we're going to fix you up so that you are happy. You are more functional. It's really an industrial view right. <laughs> of who we yeah. are, that we need to be fixed. Like the carburetor needs to be replaced and then we'll move more smoothly. But, you know, there's a lot of science that taken in aggregate suggests a very different view of depression. The first is that I've spent 20 years studying depression at multiple levels of analysis, at the level of MRI, at the level of genotyping, at the level of long-term clinical course studies. And I'm going to share you know, just two or three findings and let Please, yeah. you know our listeners discover together with us what actually might be going on, if that's okay. Oh, please. Yes, please. Okay. 
So the first is we looked at people who recovered from depression, not through medication, but through a deepening of inner life, through a deepening of spiritual awareness and had a breakthrough. And when they did, you know, we looked at people, these people were mean age 26, right? What we found is that they had developed a very, very strong, strong personal spirituality. And in fact, if you go around and you talk to people, 25, 26, 27, those who have a very profound spiritual life, who feel connected, feel that life is loving and guiding, who sense that we're part of a larger symphony, um, that what happens here has everything to do what happens with in Vietnam and China, we're connected and one, love guided and held. Those folks two, are two and a half times more likely to have suffered in the past 10 years. Oh, wow. People who with a deep spiritual awareness have been through a road of trials, have felt pain, and were called by that pain to look at life more deeply and figure out who really am I in this world and actually what more deeply is the nature of life. So those with a strong spiritual core in their mid-20s are two and a half times more likely to have been depressed, major mm. depression in the past 10 years. Now, let's stick with those folks and look out upon the horizon over the next 10 years from age 26 to 36. What we find is that having established this seat of awareness, what I'm calling the awakened brain, capacity to see into life more deeply, we are now 75% less likely, three-fourths less likely to have another major depression over the next 10 years. Wow. And if we happen to be at high risk, you know, mom was depressed, life has been hard, maybe I don't have enough resources, we're actually 90% less likely. In fact, the more suffering that could feasibly come our way, the more likely that how I sit with that is in a deep state, a spiritual response to loss, disappointment, such that I don't hit a deep major depression again. So you know, when you see that, when you see that the spiritual core is built from suffering and that once built is a form of protection and resilience against recurrence, then we have to say there's something about the developmental path of adult spiritual growth and flourishing, the evolution of adult spiritual awareness mm -hmm. that has everything to do with suffering and its um, foment and its, and its, its yeah. metabolism. Now, can I do one more scientific of course, fact? Of course, of okay. course, please. We then looked at the brains of those very same people. And what we found was that sustained spiritual life, now from 26 to 36, 38, was associated with thick, rich cortex. I mean, cortex is processing power. So people with a sustained spiritual life effectively had greater processing power in regions of the brain, the parietal, occipital, and precuneus, regions of reflection, perception, and orientation. So I could live in the same family, in the same apartment building, and have the same job and the same friends, and it all looks different mm -hmm. looking through my thick, nice, awakened brain. Yeah. Yes. Now, with uh, eight, yeah, oh, my big one, one yes, left yes, over yes, please, call, please, and then we'll run. Yeah. Um, with 80% of overlap, those nice, thick regions of the awakened brain are not thick, but thin in people who have recurrent major depression, hmm. offering evidence that sustained spiritual life, awakened living is neuroprotective against recurrent depression. I mean, that, yeah. that yeah. says we're looking at two sides of the same coin. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it makes me think too of that imaging study that was done of the advanced meditators. I believe they had like shrunken amygdalas and they had thickened PFCs, just like you're, you're talking about. Um, forgive me if my my neurology is off there but it was something to that effect and you know what you're talking about is just so foreign i think to the way that most people live their lives in this very sheltered temperate bubble where oddly by having all of our needs met we're contributing to our depression and our listlessness right and there has to be, and this has like become a core part of my own philosophy. And I've actually been in the, the very painful process of trying to construct a book around this idea is that there's a kind of struggle that we badly need. And it's a sort of like initiatory struggle that, you know, we have nothing 
built around in our culture around this kind of initiatory struggle. And even the spiritual paths that are at our disposal are pretty absent of this direct experience and this direct interfacing with a sort of meaningful struggle. So I think this is why you're seeing, you know, this renewed interest in plant medicines and shamanism and, um, you know, even kind of like proxy ordeal initiations, like things like cold exposure and extreme sports, because all of these things put you in touch with this. And, you know, over the years of doing podcasts, I've come across multiple instances of these things from people like, you know, you might be aware of Wim Hof, who, um, you know, sub he holds all these world records in submerging his body in cold water and ice. But he's he does it because he's a yogi and it's like a deeply spiritual thing for him. And he refers to the cold as his teacher. And I've also had a, a filmmaker on the show who made um, a, a, a documentary about extreme endurance running. And it's about this 3000 mile 60, 70 day long foot race that people do. And the only people that finish it, like the world record holder who wins time and time again, is this like, is this spiritual, again, yogi type character who is, feels like he's merging with the divine through his running. And um, he also profiles like Navajo runners who, who do, you know, spiritual running. And you don't get into these states of expanded awareness without really, I mean, you know, maybe suffering isn't the right word or people would, would use the, would, would take issue with that term. But I, I just use struggle because I feel like it's a, a nice midpoint between the two where it's, there, there is this energetic hump of discomfort that you have to surmount to see this strange fleeting beauty on the other side of it, you know, and that really changes you. Every bit of science mirrors your wisdom. And in the awakened brain, I share stories of contributors in our society. So for instance, Tim Shriver, who leads the Special Olympics, mm. he's a contributor, right? And um, Reverend Walter Fluker, who's the leading expert on, mm. he's effectively the leading black theologian, right? So these are people who are really doing good things. And every one of them tells their awakened story that as a young adult, they suffered and they suffered deeply. And it was through the struggle that you describe that a breakthrough came and they saw that, yes, you know, I am worthy. Life is good. God is with me. Spirit holds me up. We are connected. They have a deep breakthrough. And it is through that lens of augmented awareness. It is through an awakened awareness that they go on to discern their calling and ultimately make their largest contribution. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and these people are, from, you know, from all different walks of life. I mean, there's a fellow who runs one of our country's largest companies, a CEO. And there's a fellow, Stephen Rockefeller, who led the Earth Charter, which brought human rights one step further to Earth rights. Hmm. You know, so really innovative, loving, high impact work was born from people who had breakthroughs through struggling, reached awakening, and then used their awakened awareness to lead their lives. Yeah. Do you have any inkling, inkling of what the best way to do that is or, or what some effective ways to do that are? Because, you know, I'm not proposing that people have to like be extreme athletes or, or, you know, go to the Amazon and chug ayahuasca, even though I do think that that is a very powerful and effective tool um, from my own experience. And I would say that that is my, the most nuclear distillation of of what we're discussing that I've personally experienced was just to be truly, truly feel like I was in the depths, the pits, I was done, I was dead, and then to be pulled back out and, mm -hmm. and just be so deeply, deeply grateful for the what was once the kind of beige mundane consensus reality that just wasn't doing it for me like the c coming out of that and going back to to everyday life was truly the greatest most miraculous seeming thing i've ever experienced but from a scientific lens and, and in your personal experience what, what do you think some of the best ways to achieve the requisite level of of, of challenge are to to receive this benefit is there is there anything you know of 
Well, and as you suggest, it's a challenge welcomed and then um, an openness, a, a curiosity, a sticking with it um, to deepen our spiritual awareness and have a response to that. You know, and as you point out, every tradition through time has led us through the desert to a deepening. And it's very often um, in this process of being in the so-called desert or literal desert and breaking through to the other side that we hit a level of awareness that then is always there for us. But it's not enough, you know, as you suggest, to go home and say, wasn't that great, to return to life and wear that, wear, use those same eyes to show up for our very own family back in our very own same house. You know, to not say goodbye, I'm enlightened and you're left behind, right. but to say, I see you with such love and I want to help you realize your deepest true nature, right?